Hi and welcome. I am delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you about the exciting and fast developing field of fintech, a fusion of financial services, data science and communications technology. The term fintech is relatively new and whilst, whilst most will have heard of it, many would understandably ask what it means or stands for. Given this, a good starting point for our discussion would be to provide a definition of fintech. And this is my definition, a working definition. Fintech is the innovative use of technology to enhance procedures for transferring, raising and investing money and capital. Later I will define another term, one we are encountering increasingly in this space, tech fin. Collectively, fintech and tech fin span what we can think of as modern finance. Now, from the definition of fintech, it is clear that it represents some form of hybrid of finance and technology, and that is a good place to start. The financial services sector has always been at the forefront of technological innovation and has used technology frequently to disrupt and come up with new and better ways of doing things. This started a long time ago from the dawn of civilization, essentially. From the use of gold nuggets or basic, co basic coins as a store of value in the age of barter, to the introduction of paper money in the age of coins. Paper money first appeared in the British Isles a little over 300 years ago, Scotland being the first of the UK nations to adopt it. That was before the UK was, was formed, in fact. There are, however, records of paper money being used in China almost 1,000 years before it first appeared here. Then we had cheques start to appear in the age of paper money, and indeed they have been around for approximately 300 years and are a UK creation. Next came credit cards in the age of cheques. These first appeared in the UK in the mid-60s, with Barclay, Barclays the first to introduce them. They had originated as charge cards in the form of the Diners Club card in the US in the 1950s and would soon evolve into credit cards and subsequently into the Visa, MasterCard, American Express networks we know today. The first ever Diners Club transaction took place in a restaurant in New York in February 1950 in an event that with, within the financial services industry became known as the First Supper. Then there arrived ATMs, or automated teller machines, in the age of human bank tellers. ATMs, or cash points, have been around for about 50 years, and indeed Barclays Bank in Enfield, England, in 1967, unveiled the world's first ATM. Certainly a world's first in the form we currently recognise as an ATM. We have witnessed the emergence of online trading in the age of stock market traders and brokers. This development mirrored increasingly accessible and affordable computing power, together with the boom in programming and software development and the World Wide Web. Innovation has really accelerated uh, in recent years to include the appearance of digital wallets in the age of physical wallets, cryptocurrency in the age of fiat currency, decentralized blockchain ledgers running on public networks in the age of private centralized bank servers and databases, robot financial advisors in the age of human financial advisors. The list goes on, clearly demonstrating the inextricable link between finance and technology, a link that spans the ages. <coughs> now, in order to provide some structure to our understanding of fintech, a useful starting point is to identify a range of financial services which we encounter in everyday life. The financial services industry is a very broad church covering a dizzying array of products, processes and services. However, we can get a good feel for its core activities by looking at the banking sector. Most things that go on in financial services are in one way or another connected to banks and banking. And banks are things we are familiar with. Banks offer and maintain accounts, all kinds of accounts from basic bank accounts to current accounts to business and deposit accounts. They store our money with trust. Well, by and large, they do. Though the irony should not be lost on us that it was through not always storing our money with trust that brought about the global financial crisis in 2007 and 2008, the single most influential event in the emergence of FinTech. The banking system is instrumental in overseeing payments of all sorts, whether in cash, cheque, 
debit card, credit card, drafts, standing orders, direct debits, across gifts, donations, retail, household bills, salaries, pensions, benefits and more. When we need to raise money, say to make a purchase, to refinance debt or to fund a project, banks are often the first place we go, whether that be for an overdraft, a personal loan, a credit card or a mortgage. Banks offer the full range of lending services to their personal customers. And there exists the equivalent for commercial enterprise, an even more extensive list of lending and relating services to businesses of all shapes and sizes, including on the debt side, issuing corporate bonds, and on the equity side, private equity and or venture capital, where younger companies can privately sell stakes to investors. And there is public equity in the form of issuing stock, an IPO, initial public offering, or subsequent offering SEO. Banks offer investment advice and have investment professionals, teams, departments and branches. Indeed, there are banks which exist exclusively for this purpose. Bank involvement in investment extends to providing direct and indirect stock trading services. And finally, for customers with enough money, there are services categorised as private banking and wealth management. Collectively, this spans much of what the banking sector does as a whole. Indeed, all of this activity fits under the umbrella title of full service banking. Now, in order to nail things down and provide a fintech frame of reference, so to speak, we can make a simplifying observation within and between the categories shown here. Essentially, everything that happens in financial services involves doing something with money. Either we are transferring money and capital, raising money and capital, or we are investing money and capital. Enter financial technology. In the transferring money arena, technology has saw the introduction of digital wallets, an electronic equivalent of your physical wallet, within which you can make and receive payments and purchases instantly, conveniently, and usually free of charge without money physically having to, cha to change hands. There are many manifestations of digital wallets in existence today, but when we think of digital wallet, we tend to think of PayPal the original digital wallet provider. PayPal is a US company, but it does have a significant presence in Ireland with a base in Dundalk. An extension to the pure digital wallet comes in the form of payments ecosystems, and one that springs to mind is the Chinese wallet provider Alipay. They extended PayPal's original model in two important ways. The first way relates to what happens when you load your money into an Alipay wallet. In the case of PayPal, loading money into your PayPal wallet amounts to transferring money from your bank account into PayPal's bank account, using, uh, using the traditional bank payment systems behind the scenes. However, not being a bank, PayPal is not able to do anything with the money. Their account is simply a custodian account. They cannot invest the money uh, or offer you interest on it. In the case of Alipay, when you load money into the Alipay wallet, they invest it in a money market fund, so are able to offer interest, and that encourages customers to leave money in the wallet for longer than people typically would with a PayPal wallet. This, however, highlights an important consideration in fintech, particularly in the light of fintech being a global phenomenon, that being the consideration of regulation. The Alipay approach renders them a powerful shadow bank, as a customer, you may be happy to receive interest, but your money is being invested and of course there are risks associated with that. As we shall see later, regulations and regulatory innovation is an area of major activity and interest in fintech. Indeed, regtech, as it is called, is an area of particular strength locally. Secondly, Alipay extended their wallet provision to include a range of additional investment and insurance services to customers. And that is when Ant Financial was born, though Ant Financial has recently rebranded as Ant Group. About five years ago, Ant Financial set a target of obtaining 2 billion customers worldwide over the following decade. A seemingly incredibly ambitious target, and yet halfway through that decade, they are more than halfway to achieving the target. Within the scope of payments ecosystems is also the idea of a payments gateway. 
and two companies which spring to mind in this area are Square and Stripe. Square offers a service for smaller brick and mortar merchants to be able to use their phones to process payments instead of having to invest in expensive credit card hardware and software processing terminals. Stripe did something similar in an online context for companies who don't have the internal capacity to build payments processing etc into their websites and other online offerings. I will have more to say about Stripe in a follow-up video but this is a major success story for the two young Irishmen, the Collinson brothers, who founded Stripe about 10 years ago. In 2016, they became the world's youngest self-made billionaires. And social media is getting in in the act in the payments arena. We had Venmo, who decided to add a social media interactivity layer to an already existing payments facility, incorporating emoji, selfies and likes, into the process of paying for a shared bill, which can sometimes be an awkward situation in restaurants, etc. Venmo actually is now owned by PayPal. Another social media twist in this space came in the form of China's WeChat, which we can think of as a cross between Facebook and WhatsApp. They decided to take advantage of their fast growing member base and working the other way around to Venmo embedded a payment service into their already existing social platform. This has been very successful and has proven stiff competition for their regional competitors Alipay. And of course Facebook is getting increasingly involved in the payments arena, in fact in financial services generally, as are the tech giants Amazon and Google. If you add to this the crypto take on digital payments with names such as Bitcoin, Ripple and many more, and you see the scale of the challenge that traditional banks and financial services institutions face in what up to very recently they would have considered their territory. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we tend to refer to this modern day fusion of payments and technology as pay tech. In the raising money arena, we have witnessed the rise of lending platforms, sometimes called marketplace lending. When lending platforms first appeared, they were referred to as P2P or peer-to-peer -peer, as per the, the original intention. But that terminology is falling out of favour somewhat because whilst the people doing the borrowing may well be individuals, the lending is being done mostly by institutional lenders. Players in this arena include Lending Club and Prosper from the United States and Funding Circle in Zopa and several more from the UK. Much of the decision-making process on lending platforms is made using artificial intelligence, primarily in the form of machine learning algorithms which perform uh, advanced data analytics on prospective borrowers making credit worthiness decisions on someone's capacity to afford a loan and the likelihood of not defaulting on the payments. It has been demonstrated that the machine learning algorithms are better at identifying lower risk borrowers than traditional methods using traditional data employed by the credit rating agencies who have been doing it for decades. The result being that many people have been able to access credit and pay it back successfully, who the credit rating agencies would have categorised as couldn't or wouldn't. The term platform lending is important in both its parts. The lending part is self-explanatory. It is the platform part which has most significance for fintech. A platform is an online marketplace bringing together buyers and sellers, consumers and producers, users and providers, and is a common feature in our everyday tech experience. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media provider, creates no content. Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. That's everyday tech, but it is no different in fintech. Platforms are ubiquitous. In addition to the lending platforms, we have crowdfunding platforms for raising private equity, where individual investors get direct access to startup projects. There are debt-based crowdfunding platforms where the idea is to borrow money. Leading examples of these in the UK are Assets Capital and Lending Works. Assets Capital being the first to introduce secured debt-based crowdfunding. 
Funding Circle and Zopa, mentioned earlier in platform lending, have a hand in this space also. And there is equity-based crowdfunding, where the idea is to sell some control or other rights in return for investors' money, with names such as Cedars, Crowdcube and Syndicate Room being a few leading examples in the UK. Also very popular is reward-based crowdfunding, where the idea is to take investors' money with the promise of providing them with a product or service in return. Globally, the best known are probably US platforms Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Closer to home, Crowdfunder would be one of the leading UK reward-based crowdfunding platforms. There are also donation-based crowdfunding platforms, where people make donations to what they perceive as worthy projects or causes. Names such as GoFundMe in the US and Just Giving in the UK are two you may have heard of. Platforms are also the basis for the crypto equivalent of public equity. Traditionally, firms held initial public offerings in which they raised money by the selling of shares, issuing share certificates. Now that approach is complemented, indeed rivaled, by initial coin offerings on crypto exchanges, where coins and tokens are, are the securities issued instead of shares. And secondary trading in these tokens, etc., is facilitated by smart contracts executed on public blockchain-powered platforms such as Ethereum. Also known as dApps or distributed apps, smart contracts are essentially short computer programs or scripts with actions set to be triggered at certain times in the future according to predetermined conditions and agreements. The output of these smart contracts is recorded on the host blockchain for general authentication and verification available also potentially in the case of legal action. So, just as Paytech is buzzing, the raising money arena is every bit as busy. Naming this area is a little more involved, because whilst we see the term credit tech in the fintech vocabulary, this is about more than accessing credit, so I will use the term capital tech to capture it more completely. In the investment arena, we have witnessed the emergence of robo-advisors, robots, so to speak, offering financial advice. These robots are really machine learning algorithms accessed directly through apps, websites, or indirectly by a third party providers of investment services. US-based robos Wealthfront and Betterment are two of the world's largest. In the UK, the first to appear was Nutmeg, with Money Farm currently a leader in the UK market, Moneybox and Ticker are another two recognisable UK robos. Artificial intelligence, AI in the form of machine learning, has taken this arena by storm, completely transforming the business model, directly reaching out to clients for the purpose of generating investment business. Robo-advisors bring investment and general savings opportunities to literally hundreds of millions of people across the world who otherwise could not access them. The inefficiency of traditional investment services, the people, paper, buildings, business model, meant that an entire market of customers were simply not profitable enough to reach out to. Not so when you employ the data, software and server business model of FinTech, or the three A's of apps, APIs and analytics. Through the instruments and design of microfinance, many people of ordinary means can get a foot on the savings and investments ladder for the first time in the history of the industry. The same three A's underpin stock selection and portfolio management and have again uh, completely transformed the landscape of how things are done in the arena of fund management, in particular in the passive versus active approaches to fund management. The use of exchange traded funds or ETFs and the associated low costs low fees means that the passive approach to this kind of investment is more affordable, more accessible and by and large just as effective as the less affordable, less accessible, active managed approach. There is an amazing level of activity in this arena as the AI approach is being adopted by new and existing players alike. This is Investec. Aligning financial services in this way 
allows us to identify three cornerstones of fintech. Paytech, Capital Tech and Investtech. A fintech framework. This is the framework within which many of the fintech startups are based. We have startups operating in one area or another and some of the bigger fintech players operating in all three. Globally, the incumbent establishment is also adopting this framework and adapting their existing operations to suit. Locally, this includes familiar names such as Danske Bank and specialist financial services homegrown success stories such as Fintrue, First Derivative. And in InsureTech, there is Allstate, Northern Ireland, in the form of Arity, and in RegTech, there is FSCom and others. The list goes on. At the end of the video, I have included a map of the Northern Ireland fintech ecosystem, which will let you see the breadth and depth of engagement and activity taking place right on your doorstep. The most progressive of incumbents are realising that this transition will take more than adapting their existing provision. It will actually involve rebuilding their provision from the ground up, or in tech speak, from the back office out. This realisation has led many traditional banks to partner with a selection of specialist fintechs as the best way of making the transition. Others have decided to go it alone. The standout example is surely JP Morgan Chase, one of the world's oldest and most powerful banks, one of the true incumbent giants. Among the first to truly appreciate the scale of threat on the horizon, their CEO famously remarked only a few years ago, we cannot let Silicon Valley eat our lunch, and they reacted accordingly. So comprehensively has JP Morgan embraced fintech that they now employ more software developers than Facebook and Twitter combined, approximately 50,000 developers in a workforce of 165,000. It begs the question, is JP Morgan Chase really still a bank? Or are they now a tech company that does banking? The lines are blurring. Many other incumbent banks and financial institutions are following suit, and those who don't run the risk of disappearing into the annals of history to be replaced by the so-called challenger banks, or neobanks, banks with no physical branches. The UK has three very successful examples of challenger banks, in the shape of Monzo, Starling Bank and Revolut. Now, in building this structure, I referred to two very fast developing technologies, crypto finance and artificial intelligence. We noted how these technologies enter into each of the three key fintech areas. In actual fact, they underpin them and are enabling new areas of finance in addition to enhancing the possibilities within existing areas. The distinction between the terms enhancing and enabling will be clarified in the next video, but it encapsulates the difference between what we may call fintech and what we may call tech fin.